Hi, Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself for 17 years. Here at ASH 2022 as the co-founder, chief medical officer, and executive vice president of the nonprofit CLL Society. Dr. Seymour. Hello, I'm John Seymour. I'm a physician, a hematologist, uh, and head the department at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and the Royal Melbourne Hospital uh, in Melbourne, Australia. Pleasure being with you. It's great to see you again, uh, Dr. Seymour. Um, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not one BTK inhibitor might be better than another BTK inhibitor, and we're looking at that mostly in terms of the side effects, the adverse events, and whether patients can stay on them, and there'll be some data also and in terms of how effective they are, how well do they control the disease. And you had an important paper that compared the uh, two that are approved in CLL, at least in the U.S., mm -hmm. though we do expect that we'll get approval of a third xanabrutinib very soon. And that was, paper was entitled, Assessing the Burden of Adverse Events in a Head-to-Head -head Trial of Acalabrutinib versus Ibrutinib in Previously Treated Chronic Lymphocytic Leukemia Patients. So can you tell us a little about why this trial was important. It was also quite a risky trial, I would think, to compare these two drugs to each other, both of which are excellent, you know, so. But important. Yeah. So tell us why this trial was important, what questions you wanted answered, and what you were hoping to find out about it, what kind of patients you were enrolling in this trial. Yep. yep. So the background here is the trial, the core trial, because this was a, what we call an add-on or a secondary analysis. So the core trial, as you said, was a comparison of ibrutinib and acalabrutinib. Both very good, both very effective, both well-known and established drugs in treating uh, CLL. After a prior therapy, so this was in the setting of relapsed or refractory disease, so some, and in this era, most of it was chemoimmunotherapy, and then disease recurred and the choice that faces patients and choice that fa faces physicians is, is one of these drugs more effective than the other? Does one have uh, better tolerability than the other? So the actual trial uh, was in that setting. Uh, it included patients with either deletion 17P or deletion of 11Q. At the time we thought that these were uh, adverse predictors. The impact of 11Q is far, far less, if at all, in the context of BTK inhibitors. So we, we've actually seen some data that you might even do a touch better yes. with 11Q. So it, and that's what I say to patients. When you look at the prognostic factors, most of those were developed in the chemoimmunotherapy mm -hmm. era. And there's a lot of conflicting data about 11Q, about mutation status, um, in the uh, error of the targeted therapies. So you got to constantly be shifting just what was true five years ago, not only in terms of therapeutics, but in terms of the diagnostics and prognostics is yeah. constantly changing. Yeah, and uh, exactly. I think that messaging and in the broader sense, particularly around outcome, let's use that broad word. And a number of patients will come to me and, you know, I've looked at Dr. Google, I've looked at the internet and it says, I have X time to live. And my immediate response is, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's understand where that information came from. In order to have information around what's going to happen at 10 years, that information must have been gathered and collected at least 10 to 15 years ago. Now, what were the treatments that were being used then? Right. So, so all of that is historical and backward looking, accurate and useful, but in no way does that necessarily imply that is my fate, that is what the future is. So I say to my patients, look at all that information, absolutely, bring it in, we'll discuss it, but understand that that is like reading a history book. It's important to understand, but it does not imply that is what the future will hold. You and I are on the identical page on that. What we've seen with 
And part of the reason that, that it's now, I would even say, ancient history mm -hmm. is because of drugs like ibuprofen yes. and calibrutinib. Thank you for bringing me back on track. So, <laughs> so tell me about, you were looking to see the differences between yes. these two drugs. So tell, tell yes. me what, what you were finding here. So there were two um, elements of the comparison. One was, is one drug more effective against the CLL than the other drug? And John Bird had published that information. And the short answer is, these are equivalently effective in controlling your CLL. The next question is, well, if they both get the job done equally effectively, is one more tolerable? Does it have fewer or different side effects than the other? And the traditional way in cancer treatments is to consider an event as a yes, no question. Have you, has a patient, have I ever had, for example, diarrhea? Tick, that's one in a box. And yes, both of these drugs can cause diarrhea. But that's a very, very simplistic and I would say insufficient description of a treatment that goes on, in this case, um, indefinitely, chronic treatment. So did you have diarrhea? Was it mild? Was it moderate? Was it severe? So how severe was it? But more importantly, how durable or how repetitive? Was it a single event on one day? Or was it continuous day after day after day for a year? Our traditional measures just put a tick in a box for either of those events. This analysis used a more sophisticated, far from perfect, but a more sophisticated measure that incorporated how severe was the event and how prolonged was the event and came up with a total, what we call symptom burden score that I think more accurately describes the overall impact on of these therapies. And particularly for um, the issues of um, arthralgias, sore joints, sore muscles, back pain, particularly for the issues of um, heart-related issues, irregular heartbeat, what's called atrial fibrillation, and particularly hypertension, high blood pressure, and then the issues that flow from that in terms of needing other medications. The overall burden of the adverse events was substantially greater with ibrutinib than with acalabrutinib. So one of the conclusions, and I think it's a very reasonable conclusion, is both of these drugs get the job done with similar effectiveness. Which of them achieves it in a way with less impact, less burden on average for the patient. And from this analysis, acalabrutinib was the preferred. Now, there were um, headache was one of the um, issues that was more frequent and more prolonged with acalabrutinib. But when we look at the overall contribution of that to the totality, it was a very small element. So unless a particular patient that were highly problematic or very impactful for them as an individual, that could be one patient profile who might prefer ibrutinib over acalabrutinib. But in all of the other domains, acalabrutinib was the less burdensome drug. And to be clear, we're not saying that a calibrutinib doesn't cause no. atrial fibrillation no. or hypertension or increased infection risks or diarrhea. We're Correct. just saying that it causes less. The odds are less that you would get it. Yes. So this would suggest to me that patients who are more likely, if they're not having adverse events with the drug, stay on the drug. Yes. And it, the drugs work better if you stay on them. Well, in with all medicine, 
for it to have any chance of helping, you have to get it into the body. We're yet to invent a drug that can be effective if it stays in the jar. <laughs> so, any this? I think this is an important piece of data. Any um, thoughts about how this determines what patients should be thinking about and discussing with their physician, uh, looking forward? Any kind of comments or final thoughts you want to share with patients about this important research? Yes, I think the and we've spoken before, the broad theme of understanding what's involved, empowerment and better clarity around um, the totality of the impact of any treatment, here we're talking about these drugs, is a really important element of participation in that shared decision making. The second element, and I think as relevant as these two individual drugs are, I think the bigger picture for the profession, for us as researchers, is to apply and expect and interrogate in a more nuanced and more patient-focused manner, what is the overall burden and impact of these therapies? Our previous approach had been really quite simplistic and quite crude, and this approach is not perfect. You know, it, it's, it assumes that fatigue has the same impact as arthralgia has the same impact as, and for individuals, we need to better apply a weighting for some of those symptoms. So this index that we used is not perfect. It's a step in the right direction but getting a better global measure of what is the burden of the therapies that we're recommending for and applying for our patients is a very important part of the research agenda for the field. And I, I love the fact that you're looking in terms of how we measure, how we titrate those adverse events. And, um, and I would suggest involving patients more in terms of what's important to them, getting their sense of that. So. Yes agree with you absolutely because what I as an individual may perceive to be perfectly acceptable given my age, my lifestyle, my work habits could well be very different to what somebody else finds totally unacceptable if they're working in the outdoors away from various areas so individualizing that, that uh, measurement is an important next step. And, and this did not do that. As I said, this is far from perfect. But it did give us a more nuanced look, and it did tell us the two drugs were pretty, very much similar in terms of their efficacy, which was excellent. Yes. But for most patients, a calibrutinib would have fewer side effects. Yes, and a fewer and a shorter overall duration, so on, on the totality of the time that you're taking drug, how much of that time may there be an associated unwanted effect? Dr. Seymour, I really appreciate your kind of detailed explanation because there's a lot behind that title there that you dug into and explained. Thank you very much and I'm always amazed at the incredible research that's coming out of uh, Melbourne. It's just, uh, you guys are just, you guys are just, you know, tops in terms of CLL research. It's just so exciting. Great to see you again. Thank you. Great to be speaking with you and um, all the best uh, to your patients, your members, your followers uh, in what remains a challenging time. Thank you so much.